quick note before we get going to these email shares. I totally forgot, as usual. I think it was either one video back or two video back. Two videos back, someone sent in a report of an experience they had. But they, they sent in some photographs of some six-toed prints, and they were laid down beside. They put down a size ten and a half boot, I believe they said in the email beside the six-toed prints. And here are the photos here. All right, I forgot to include those with the video. I keep doing that. It's a pain in the butt, sorry. But here they are. Peculiar, peculiar looking prints. Are they not? All right, moving along. Here we go. How's that for a steelhead river? So I'd come up and pre scout it out for tomorrow. It's a little late in the day, it's like quarter to three or something right now. This is a different river than the one I've been on. And uh, this river is typically just chock full of huge Chinook salmon in the fall. All, all flavors of salmon come up here. But there's steelhead in here right now, 100% for sure. And uh, I think I'm gonna, I'm, I think I'm gonna fly fish for them tomorrow. But anyway, I got a, a pot. I spent literally, I think I spent two hours yesterday or more, just going through emails, copying and pasting stories from all the people into my notes for share for later. We had to go travel to uh, the BC Ferries, climb on the BC Ferries, go all the way over, grab a little one, and jump back on the ferry, come all the way back and drive all the way home. So uh, one of the things I did on the boat while well, it was an hour and 40 minute ride one way was go over emails. And uh, so you guys know, I've never changed a word in one email ever, never. Um, I've never altered a story, changed a story. I've never even added a comma or a period in a story, obviously. Um, but I've had some, recently I've, I've sent some real long emails. Like one woman, I think, I think she lives. She lived on and off the island and around the coast of BC. Sent me basically a book. I don't know how long it would take me to read. It's very interesting though. There's a lot of interesting stories in there but it's basically a book and i'm trying to figure out how to tackle that because i can't condense it and take out of it i feel that i can't take out of it what i what i'm going to decide you guys get to hear or not do you know what i mean so what do i do i mean do i do i take uh give her give that one email 15 minutes of my time and then make sure other people are are heard at the same time as well or do i dedicate like three days straight to reading that one email? You know, do I condense it down and take take the meat out of it that you guys might benefit from? But how am I the one to judge what you guys should or shouldn't hear? You know what I mean? You know how, how so I'm just explaining that's how it can get a little awkward when I get sent very, very long emails. What do I do with them, right? But I'll figure it out, the answer will come. I'll probably share it in segments. Or who knows, maybe I'll go in one big, long share. I don't know, but I'll figure it out. But just so you guys know, that's what I go through when I get the real long ones, all right? Now, I'm going to go through some of the recent emails sent in because it's fairly easy. I just start at the top of my list, and I'm running out of time, so I want to go away up the valley see if I can find those bull elk while it's snowing, too. So listen to this. Hi, Steve. You can just call me Bug Nuts. <laughs> My steelheading buddies always do, thanks to my preference for fly fishing. Where I go up to Steely's in Washington is pretty remote. The fish are almost all wild, and to say I usually fish alone is an understatement. In my four decades of solo hikes and wades, I've had a bunch of weird experiences, two of which I'm absolutely, I absolutely consider encounters. I'll try to keep the story short. This happened in 2011 on a river near Mount St. Helens, which I know has a storied past as far as sightings. I had hiked up a logging road about a mile and a half from my truck, intent on wading and fishing my way back downstream to what we call the honey hole. I caught and released a nice steelhead up high, so I was that much more excited to get there. I hooked a big bright hen at the top of the hole that went ballistic with runs and leaps, but I was able to land her and get a great pick before release. As I checked my hook, and ready my gear to continue working through this stretch, a big rock came flying from behind me and bounced around on the freestone boulders between my spot and a stand of 10-foot-high willows, about 50 feet away. 
I froze and peered into the shadows, listening for any sound and watching for any movement. I knew I had the river entirely to myself, as it was a weekday, and I hadn't seen any other trucks or people on my way in. It was eerily quiet, with no leaves rustling and no birds chirping, and I felt strongly that I was being watched as my heart began to race, and the hair on my neck stood up. After a few minutes of my observation, I decided to get back to my fishing, even though the feeling of being watched had not left me. I settled down and got my focus back to the task of finding another steelhead, even as my head was spinning with, with what the Fs. About 10 minutes later, as I had reached the midpoint of the riffle, another big rock was thrown from behind the willows, this time crashing into the knee-deep water near where I'd been standing only minutes before. The best description I can give of the sound of that splash would be a shot put dropped from high dive. I freaked out. First, I shot a glance back towards the willows. When I didn't see anything, I quickly secured my gear and started moving downstream. On sheer adrenaline, I waded across the river at a spot I never would have even tried normally, but it was the fastest way back to the logging road. After climbing a steep bank on the other side, I literally ran the whole way to my truck in my waders, boots and all. After, excuse me. After tossing my rods and my pack in the bed of my truck, I jumped in, started her up, and locked the doors. Thoroughly out of breath and sweating, but feeling safe. I then replayed the whole experience in my mind. I remember my conclusions at the time. Number one, no man could have thrown that rock that far. Number two, something or somebody didn't want me there. And even though it or he cost me a couple hours of steelheading time, I was fine with that. Number three, the primal fear we have felt is real, but in a sense, it, but in a sense, irrational given the circumstances. If it wanted to, if it wanted to hurt me, it easily could have. The second story is, a, is shorter, but possibly more disturbing. One morning in the spring of 2013, I was hiking solo down a trail in an area of Wainuchi Canyon called Grisdale. In the old days, I used to be able to drive my truck way down this trail to a creek where I would park, gear up, and then wade the rest of the way to some sweet steelhead water on the Wainuchi River. More recently, though, the timber company, company that owns the lease on this land gated it at the intersection with the forest road I drove in on and began clear-cutting large swaths of evergreens in the area. The long hike in was dark and shadowy this early morning and I was moving along at a pretty quick pace since I've been tracking the river flow stats and figured the nooch would be in perfect steelhead green shape. About halfway down the trail past the clear cuts, clear cuts and into the old growth, the sound of three hard distinct wood-to-wood -wood knocks stopped me in my tracks. The knocks were methodically slow and rhythmic, and it sounded as if they came from just ahead of me and a few hundred feet off the left side of the trail. It was definitely, deafeningly silent after the knocks, and I squinted in the low light, scanning the woods ahead of me in an effort to see any movement. Every muscle in my body tensed up, and all my hairs stood on end for the next few minutes as I started to think about my options. The prevailing thought was to say, screw it, and continue on down the river to the river because I was jazzed to fish this day and I'd already done all that work to make it this far. Rather than just hiking along quietly, however, I decided to announce my presence by making some spastic random yells and sounds of my own. Right before I made it to the creek some 15 minutes later, I once again heard loud knocks of wood. Only this time, there were only two and they came from slightly behind me and on the opposite side of the trail. Holy shit, I thought. That's either something following me or there's more than one. I felt safer once I made it to the clearing of a huge gravel bar along the river, and I commenced to hunting some native steelhead all the while feeling like I was being watched, tracked, or both. I must have sounded like a complete spaz for the next few hours as I waited, fished, and yelped my way to my favorite riffle. I found a couple of aggressive winter steelies that morning, but the thought of the hike up and out through the shadows was looming the whole time. Fortunately, the brisk walk up was uneventful, and boy was I glad to see my truck when I, when I reached that point of the trail. The really fascinating part came when I struck up a conversation with a lady bartender at a roadside tavern. I stopped out to calm my nerves on the drive out of the valley. My phone's getting covered in snow. It's sec. Oops. I mentioned to her that I had an interesting experience on the Grisdale Woods that morning while hiking in to fish. 
And instead of scoffing at my story, the lady leaned forward to me and said, Oh, you gotta hear this. She proceeded to tell me the tale told by a group of loggers that began making daily treks into those same woods when the harvesting began a few years earlier. As these lumberjacks would sip would sip their end-of-the-day whiskey and chug their beers, they told her of frequent sightings of not just a Sasquatch, but a family of Sasquatches. According to her, they would talk openly about this group of hairy beings, some short and precarious, oh, and precocious, some short and precocious, and a couple very tall and beastly who would be seen walking the cut line almost every morning as if it was their daily routine. And that these beings didn't seem all that bothered by the comings and goings of the logging trucks. When I asked her opinion of why this wouldn't be reported and slash or no pictures or video had ever surfaced, she spoke of a code amongst the loggers that they observed in order to keep the government's eyes out so they could do their jobs without interference. Unbelievable. As for me, I've had plenty of friends and family with whom I've chosen to share these stories ask me why in the hell I'd go out there in the wild alone in a particular in particular, why I wouldn't be carrying a gun? My simple answers have always been that it keeps me young. I'm 56 and that I'm a minimalist steelheader and don't want to carry too much gear. As for the first part, the truth is that being out there at the mercy of whatever I may come across is exhilarating and does make me feel young again. And as for the second part, the truth is I don't think I'd have the heart to shoot one of these things unless I was truly being attacked which frankly doesn't seem that likely to me. Keep up the good work, sir. Keep up the good work, Steve, and I trust my contact info will remain confidential with you. Of course it will, man. Thanks for that. Thanks for that email. And sure, as I was reading it, it just took me right back to my days. Man, I remember like when I was 18, 19, 20, 21, and I would drive from, I would drive up the west coast of Vancouver Island to a place called Port Renfrew. You can Google it up, Google it up. I need to double back, start heading up the San Juan River, and then hang a left and go up another old logging road, which apparently is paved now, and I haven't been there since it's been paved, to another little steelhead river called Harris Creek. And same thing, I used to walk into that Harris Creek in the timber, in the dark timber, very remote, by myself, and uh, the whole time hoping I wasn't going to bump into one of these damn things, because I really wanted to go catch one of the steelhead, right? There's a lot of sightings right around me here in the timber, in the forest, on either side of this river behind me too. I'd be lying if I wasn't thinking about these things when I'm gonna get geared up tonight to go to go steelhead fishing up, up river and in, in the timber tomorrow morning and hiking in the dark. But it is what it is, right? Now when it comes to the knocking on the, the wood knocking, myself, uh, from what I've learned, what I've witnessed firsthand by myself in the forest, I'm 100% convinced that the wood knocks are for one thing and one thing only, and that's communicating between each other, not with us. That's what I've, the conclusion I've come to. So if you're hearing wood knocks, I strongly believe that the wood knocks are talking about you. Take from that what you will or leave it. But anyway, thanks for sending that in, man. Thanks for sending that in. I'm getting cold. I'm going to possibly do one more here. And uh, be safe out there. Make sure you don't quit steelheading ever because of this. But also listen to your gut and leave when your gut tells you to, all right? That's very important. What we got here? Uh, ba -bum -bum. Central Texas experiences. All right. Steve, after finding your channel by chance, I've now binge watched so many of your videos and I've finally been convinced to share a couple of my run-ins. Also, thank you for the platform where these can be shared and not judged. Call me Tex. One of my nicknames I earned while serving. I haven't always will be a lover of hunting and fishing. I also served 12 years. I had my fair share of combat, and it takes quite a bit to rattle me. I've had more experiences where the gut feeling would kick in and put me on high alert. Below is a couple of those run-ins. First run-in. 1994, actually seeing one or I should say the outline in the dark was coming back from base and headed home as it was an eight hour drive one way between two to three a.m. on a two lane road between country towns. I was driving slow due to deer on one side of the road and being super tired. I got an eerie feeling and something said stop. 
I did rather quickly and wondered where it came from as I was only the only one in the vehicle and the windows were down. In front of me, maybe 20 yards up the road, around six or seven deer shot across the road in a super rushed pace. And then I noticed something big, greenish white eyes, dark colored, hairy and scary looking behind them crossing the barbed wire fence by stepping over it and slowly kept going across the grassy area and across the road onto the other side, which, like the other side, had about 10 to 15 yard grassy area and then the fence. The side it was headed to was wooded and I lost track of it once it went into that area. The whole time I had a queasy feeling in my stomach until it reached the wooded area and disappeared. I heard what seemed like a voice beside me say, just say, go now. I sat there for whatever seemed like forever, but in reality about around one to five minutes. I tried to figure out what I had seen or thought I had seen. The gut queasy feeling long gone, and I was now wide awake staring side to side to see if anything else is out there. That was my first time seeing one. Wow. Second experience. In 1997, myself and a high school friend went out fishing on a river in an area on a rancher's property. We took a truck pretty much within 10 yards of the river and planned to fish overnight, judging, jugging, jugging, tying off a baited catfish line to a milk jug and letting it float in a deeper part of the river bend. We decided that we would sleep in the crew cab instead of trying to drive back out at night. We made a fire in the sand of the river bank and sat up watching our jug lines for a bit, drinking and watching the fire. We could hear coyotes in the distance and figured we would put out the fire and get some sleep. My buddy took the front seat and I took the back seat. Our heads at the opposite ends and drifted off. A noise woke me and as soon as I woke, that gut feeling said we were being watched and whatever it was was close. I could see out the far side of the vehicle due to, due to head at the left side and could look upwards out left side. I only, moved my, I only moved my eyes trying to see anything, but I only seen the light fog and the stars above. I waited for a bit and did not see anything, so I started to drift back off again when something pushed down on the back of the truck, rocking it. I was fully awake in record time due to that eerie gut feeling. As we always carried guns with us in case of snakes, I grabbed mine and sat up looking out the black back glass. I seen a big, dark, and tall silhouette disappear into the fog, and I could hear growls. My buddy was sitting up in the front, staring out the windows, slowly checking our surroundings. He quietly asked if I'd seen what moved the truck, and I said I thought it might have been a wild hog or something, because I did not think he would believe me. I did not go back to sleep the rest of the night and kept a close eye on our surroundings with no other issues that night. The gut feeling left me in a, left me in a couple minutes after watching that figure walk off in the fog. It took another two years before we discussed that night over a, a fire drinking beers. He asked me if I saw what rocked the truck and I told him I'd definitely seen its outline and described as much as I had seen. Tall, broad shoulders, dark in color, looked hairy from behind as it was already turned around headed away. He said that he had seen that much as well, but thought his eyes were playing tricks on him. We never went back there fishing overnight again, and Uncle Sam sent me off to another state for a few years far away from home. I haven't felt that gut fear feeling since then. It hasn't stopped me from enjoying the outdoors, but I haven't spent a night camping since. I honestly can say that now that I know more, I look forward to my next encounter. <laughs> I apologize for this being so long and I did not share all the details as this would have made this email super long. All the best to you, the wife and four-legged kids signed Tex. Holy shit, Tex. Thanks for that email, man. And uh, if you get a chance, you know, if, if, try not, you know, all, all you listening to this, don't leave out details, all right? Try not to leave out details. If details that I might or you might think aren't very important, could possibly be the missing piece of somebody's puzzle, right? It's a possibility. And uh, so just take note of that, you guys. If you're about to send one in, don't leave anything out. And if you think it's getting too long and you're shortening it up or you're gonna save some for later for another email, don't do that. Send it all in, send it all in one go. Just try to condense it so it doesn't take a month to read it. <laughs> you know what I mean? I wonder how many fish are out there right now.
One thing for sure I know is there are steelhead in this river behind me right now. I don't know what I want to do more. I want to use my bait caster or fly fish or just send the camera down. I love sending the camera down the river and seeing what's swimming around in there. I love it. This is a great, great chunk of water for it. All right. Let's get one more out. I, I don't have a clue how long I've been. Oh, what time is it? All right. Like I might have time for a short one. I don't want to miss the nose elk being able to film them if I can find them. All right. Here we go. <clears throat> Michigan Sasquatch from this past gun for whitetail season. Hey, sleep. Hey, Steve, please don't use my name. This account's been going on for a few years, 20 to 25 years. To give you a geographical location, me and my family have a blank sized acres in the heart of the Blank Valley and National. Okay, I'm not going to say just from what you just said, I'd be able to find your name and your property in about five minutes on the line, all right? So I'm going to leave that part out because you do not want your name shared and what you just gave me for the location would direct me right to your name, okay? Anyway, typically early morning around prime time, first weekend of bow season, stalked and tracked a decent 10 pointer. He always kept about 40 to 75 yards ahead, but never got my scent. I was downwind. I tracked him for a good two hours, then heard nothing until I darn near spooked him. He shot up out of some brush and took off like a bat out of hell. Normally, white tails will sprint straight for a bit, look around, trot, and then kind of wander. I know this, so I kept at him for a good hour. Nevertheless, after two hours of being quiet, I took my shot at about 30 yards. The odd thing about that circumstance was I know I spooked him and heard and saw him tear off into the brush, but I also heard a different thing run off too. My first thought was I kicked up another deer. Man, was I wrong. I spent a lot of time in the woods. Come first week in a bow season in Michigan, the ground is littered with dead oak leaves, birch bark, acorns, and ferns. I know the sounds of grouse, woodcock, squirrel, or a deer walking through. What I heard after taking that shot was odd. I can only describe it as fluid thump, maybe. Not even that. It was audible, but quiet. Best way I could say is I could hear walking sounds, but it wasn't the typical wasn't the typical of an animal. Either way, I found my kill after tracking a great blood trail and took care of business. Walking back with my harvest was different though. I always felt like someone was watching me, and that's not the first time. I never, this time, saw an entity or anyone, but definitely felt it in my bones that I was being watched. Thanks for taking the time to read this, and I have about a dozen other instances I can tell you about, especially when it comes to the BFRO and staying on my property for 48 hours and leaving a bunch of garbage. <laughs> have a great holiday and hope to hear back from you. Much love and respect. Hey, man, thanks for that email. You're lucky to have gotten that deer. It's, it's, no, uh, it's no secret that these bush people are opportunists and they'll take our game, right? They'll take it from camp hanging on the hook or they will uh, cut us off from the blood trail, scoop it up and run with it. From me, I would be on fire. Because if, it was, if I was deer hunting, like the deer that I go after, I typically watch that, the same deer for, well, I got two bucks from watching, I'm going on my sixth year now, and they're absolute monsters. And, um, so, and they are right, I have, I've seen footprints and heard these things and had that real weird trail camera video I shared with you guys last year those glowing eyeballs and shit in the background and that's right where I chase these two big bucks so I more than more than a few times I've pictured sticking an arrow in one of these monsters knowing I pinned it perfectly and then going to track it down and one of these things took off with it I would be so so freaking angry I'd be like you know what go, 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 go hunt your own freaking deer down quit being a prick you know? Oh, that'd make me mad. But anyway, it's time to go. I'm going to go farther up the valley, and I'm going to see if I can find those bull elk. I think it'd be really cool if I could film them in this snow blizzard. One of them's gone now. One of the first draw tags available for that herd went out to a, a man of First Nations band here, and he shot one of those big old ones. 
it's gone now. And uh, next year apparently is going to be the first year they have a draw tag available for general population here. So I better get at it now while they're still thinking it's it's cool to run around with each other in full view of, of people and see if I can go get a couple last video captures of that that herd of bulls because it's Roosevelt elk they typically when a, a big Roosevelt elk typically goes off by himself and all grumpy and, and non-social so to come across a herd of bachelor bulls like that is virtually almost unheard of and I got to take advantage of that as much as I can and, and film as much as of that as I can I love it I'll be back and I'll share more tomorrow while I'm fishing up here in this river all right be safe out there